Martin, thanks for coming out this evening. This is the, the fourth of five lectures in our Faith and Fiction series. Let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, pour out your blessings on us tonight. Give us your grace. Increase your grace within us. And bless our speaker uh, as he enlightens us. We ask all this through Our Lady's intercession. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, close friend of mine, Father Henry Steffen who is serving currently at our Dominican parish in Cincinnati, St. Gertrude. Uh, so Father Henry um, grew up in California and attended um, a college in New Jersey. Um, I always forget the name of it. Was It has like a P at the front. Prin so Princeton. So uh, and majored in political science at Princeton. Um, but I'm very pleased that, that he's um, been open to the idea of speaking on Jane Austen, showing us something of the, the moral teaching we can we can derive or benefit from our, our reading. Um, Father Henry entered the order in 2011, uh, so a year after myself, and was ordained um, a year, almost a year ago now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, anything else I'm forgetting? Nope. Okay. <laughs> he says, just, just move. <laughs> well, please join me in welcoming Father Henry. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm not going to help him out too much. You know, it's, it's his job to do the introduction. I hope everyone has a copy of our handout, uh, Pride, Prejudice, and Prudence, Jane Austen as an Aristotelian Novelist. So if you don't have a handout, blame our handout Sherpa over there. I want to begin, you'll see that my very first point on here is, well, this is awkward. Well, this is awkward. Uh, and it is, because I looked at the advertising for this series. I did, you know, because I figure if I'm going to give a talk, it's a good idea to look and see what is being advertised, what's being offered. And this is a series about Catholic novelists. I don't, I want to break this to you gently. Are you all sitting down? <laughs> Jane Austen is not a Catholic novelist. She wasn't Catholic. She wasn't Catholic. Truth in advertising, Father. Come on now. Jane Austen wasn't Catholic, and she didn't write a great deal about religion. She was an Anglican, and that's just distasteful, uh, you know, if you're an Anglican. I mean, it's all well and good to be, to be devout, but let's not make this weird, you know. That's the Anglican MO. Uh, in truth, there's more that we can say about Jane Austen's religious faith. Uh, we knew that she was the daughter of a clergyman. She had a great Christian sensibility about her, but she was not, to our knowledge, educated in theology, and she didn't have a deep philosophical training, at least formally. So it's important that at the very outset we acknowledge she's not Catholic, though she participated in a kind of culture that still had a lot of Catholic elements, and that she was reared in a household that had a lot of traditional Christian pious devotions. We have some of her prayers. In fact, one series of writings that I want to refer you all to is actually a series of posts on our Dominicana blog written by my classmate, Father Aquinas Beale, who did a beautiful job. Every post begins with an excerpt from one of Jane Austen's prayers. And so if you want to encounter Jane Austen in a different way, go look up Dominicana Journal and look up Jane Austen and you'll see Father Aquinas's posts. I edited them back when I was a student, brother. Uh, the second thing I want to note is that to, as far as we know, Jane Austen never read Aristotle. And I'm sorry as you're walking in to brace you, but so far I've revealed that Jane Austen is not Catholic and never read Aristotle, which is making this entire thing very awkward, really. She never read Aristotle, to our knowledge. She may have been influenced indirectly, as I said. There is an ambiance, there's a culture, there's an air. And in fact, this doesn't remove the claim that she was a profoundly Aristotelian novelist. But it does mean that we should temper our our ambitions in what we're hoping to say here. There's no pretense that we can make to show a direct line from St. Thomas or even from Aristotle to Jane Austen. No matter how hard, every Dominican always tries to make a straight line from everything. 
uh, go back to St. Thomas and Aristotle. So, so there's no straight line here. All that we can note are correspondences and ways of, of suggestion that help us read her more deeply. Finally, and I put it here as the first thing because I do think it's a problem. It's a problem. Jane Austen doesn't seem like a serious enough novelist for us to consider in this way. Why are we subjecting romantic novels to this kind of analysis? Can you tell me, Father Raymond, why are we doing this? It's a great question. It's a great question. Jane Austen has been dismissed as a sentimentalist, as someone who's trying to reconcile classical notions of friendship with a kind of married romanticism or a romanticism about marriage. Her novels seem missish sometimes. You know, how can we say that there's philosophical depth underlying them? All of this is meant to pose the problematic, which I, heroic lecturer that I am, will solve for you. So fear not, fear not, fear not. I've just posed a false problem and now I'm gonna give you a solution to it. Uh, so this is a true intellectual exercise. What does it mean exactly, though, to be called an Aristotelian novelist? When, when, that is, when that phrase is bandied about, what is it that we mean? I want to refer you to this book by Alistair McIntyre. This is a classic. I'm sure you've heard it referenced before. It's titled After Virtue. Alistair McIntyre, one of the great philosophers based out of our own Father Raymond's alma mater, Notre Dame, uh, wrote After Virtue, and it has been one of those seminal works of contemporary political and philosophical thought that has changed the conversation. There's a striking thing about it. He dedicates about 20 pages to discussing how Jane Austen is the last great Aristotelian novelist. The last great Aristotelian novelist. Now knowing all of those awkward facts that we pointed out at the beginning, it may seem a little tenacious that he would make this claim. And no literary scholar he, no literary scholar me for that matter, what exactly are my qualifications to deliver this talk? Do, you, do, you, what, do we want to get, I went to Princeton, so hail alma mater, you know, so for all, that's, that's a wonderful thing. I have no expertise whatsoever. It's actually kind of farcical for me to claim to be able to give a coherent answer to this question, but since when has lack of qualification stopped a Dominican from advancing a claim? So, so here we are. Here we are. Alistair McIntyre, who's an authority I can stand behind, Alistair McIntyre claimed that Aristotle's notion of virtue, Aristotle's understanding of purpose, of meaning, of direction and order in life, infuses the sensibility with which Jane Austen wrote her novels. So when we see in Jane Austen the dramas that the characters are undergoing, it's a drama about character. It's a drama about virtue in many ways. And that all takes place within a certain context. So really, when we're looking at this claim, can we call Jane Austen an Aristotelian novelist if she never read Aristotle? Absolutely. Because the claim that you're Aristotelian isn't a matter of philosophical pedigree. It's a matter of viewpoint. It's a way of looking at reality. It's an understanding of what constitutes human happiness. So when we claim that Jane Austen can best be read, can most profitably be understood, can more deeply be unlocked and appreciated by looking at her novels through the lens of Aristotelian philosophy, that's not to say that she wrote it self-consciously as a philosopher. She wasn't. But to say that this perspective on reality, this understanding of human happiness, helps us enter in more deeply. And when we pick up a work of literature like Austen, when we decide to embrace this monster of a book, the complete novels, you know, when you decide to watch that Pride and Prejudice movie again, when you enjoy the BBC miniseries from so many years ago, just to see that, that scene where whatever his name is, golf falls into the lake that my mother always appreciated. Uh, when you do all of that, that there's a way of getting deeper about what Austin values, about what she understands, when we have these tools of Aristotelian philosophy. And of course, every time I say Aristotelian, look at what I'm wearing. What do you think I mean? I mean St. Thomas's way of understanding Aristotle. I mean a classically Thomistic way of appreciating what's going on. And therefore, we can say with a profoundly Christian sensibility, with a profoundly realistic way of looking at life, with a way of understanding what counts towards human happiness. 
So that's actually quite a lot. So we aren't actually out at sea at all. There actually is a great deal that we can do to better understand Jane Austen as an Aristotelian. There are three elements that I'm going to be referring to several times in here. These are the kind of core of the talk. The three elements that make Jane Austen Aristotelian. You could name more. You could go into, into greater depth. If you were a literary critic or a professor of English, you would find this hopelessly inadequate. But that's OK. Is anyone here a professor of English or a literary <laughs> critic? Let the camera reflect no one indicated yes. <laughs> Thanks be to God. So all right. There are three things, and I've averred to them already. There's an understanding of reality and human happiness. That's the first element that helps make Austin Aristotelian. Secondly, there's a classical account of the virtues and what is the virtuous life. And third, there's an appreciation for genuine friendship and human community. So each one of these areas will afford us a way of looking at all of Austin's novels in a deeper way. Let's start off with, this is point three on your handout, Austin's domestic account of the virtues. So first of all, let's backtrack to Aristotle. What is Aristotle's account of the virtuous life and of the place in which virtue is developed and human happiness is attained? For Aristotle, it's all about the polis, the polis, the Greek word for city. Man is a social and political animal. It's all this Rousseauian garbage about man being most himself when he's alone or before he enters into society is just what it is, garbage. Absolutely. It's actually a pernicious error because it leads to all sorts of self-deceptions that we can commit, misunderstandings that we can fall into. Aristotle's understanding here is important because he's not just saying, all right, mankind tends to live together. No, it's a stronger claim than that. The claim is that there is a uniquely human form of happiness, a human form of fulfillment. Aristotle, that Greek would call it eudaimonia. There is a form of fulfillment that only is possible when we live in community, in communion with one another, in koinonia, in communicatio, all of these different Greek and Latin ways of saying the same thing. As Hillary Clinton might say, it takes a village. I'm kidding, don't worry. Everyone calm down. <laughs> Everyone calm down. I just wanted to see if I still had your attention. <laughs> In truth, it does take a village, but the problem is it also takes a family. In fact, first and foremost, it takes a family, and then it takes a community, which is not the same as the state, but then there's still a bigger community of the state beyond that. There's the whole union that exists between citizens, between family members, between people who are in a society together. This way of understanding human beings as belonging, as fundamentally belonging, is at the heart of Aristotle's account of virtue and happiness. In order to be most fully human, most fully yourself, in order to realize remunditas, remundity, most fully, Father Raymond has to live in a community. And that community can take all these different forms that I've talked about. Father Raymond came from a family. In fact, I love his family. His family is great. <laughs> In fact, if Mr. Snyder's watching, I say hello to him. Uh, he, had, he had dogs. There were dogs who were a member of this family, too. But beyond that, beyond that, Raymond, Father Raymond, is a part of a wider community. Let's take him now in his present case. He's part of a Dominican community, bound by the vows. He's part of a parish community, St. Patrick's. He's part of a wider city, Columbus, and the diocese that reflects that locality. He's a citizen of the United States. He's a Roman Catholic. He's a Christian. He's a member of the human family. He's a part of the universe that ultimately is ordered to God himself. Father Raymond is all of these things. And in order to be Father Raymond, he can't think of himself as being radically independent from all these memberships. These memberships don't destroy his individuality. They make it. They make it. To set the family in opposition to the individual or the country in opposition to the family is a way of creating a profoundly conflicted and ultimately alienated sense of identity. It's a source of much unhappiness. This is where I'm going to stop myself from going into a full-blown rant. Everyone's going <laughs> to make a sigh of relief. But here's the underlying point. We need the community 
not as some kind of totalitarian project, but in order to belong. We can't exercise certain virtues unless we live amongst other people. We can't attain a breadth of thinking and of knowing. We can't contemplate the good, the true, and the beautiful unless we are enriched by other members of this human family, and particular members here who can sometimes be challenging, who often are challenging, uh, just to use an example. So what does this have to do with Jane Austen? Jane Austen doesn't write about cities. Jane Austen doesn't write about great things, it would seem. Jane Austen's writing about drawing rooms. Even in the middle of a worldwide conflagration, Napoleonic wars, political instability, economic and military upheaval, Jane Austen's dramas never go much beyond Meryton. You know, they never go far beyond the shades of Pemberley. They're always rooted in a particular place. So is she picayune? Is she small-minded? Does she ignore what's going on? To the contrary. Jane Austen is an Aristotelian, but in a properly feminine and Christian way. She's talking about a reality of a human community that affords meaning and purpose. The context and setting in which virtue can be developed, and indeed the root, the soil in which humans find their fulfillment, attain happiness. So as as, uh, as we have here from McIntyre, Highbury and Mansfield Park act as substitutes for the Greek city-state or the medieval kingdom. They act as substitutes. And in a real sense, they are. They are. Because the city-state and the medieval kingdom don't exhaust who we are. Like, we can still profitably understand ourselves in these ways. And in fact, our first encounter with common good our first encounter with a membership in something greater than ourselves, it's our families. It's our families. And so it makes sense that Jane Austen would have a profound sense that when she writes about these seemingly small things, it's not a smallness that contains or exhausts. It's a smallness teeming with richness and meaning. It's a smallness that is rich because it's local and particular. It's a smallness that is potent because it helps people develop virtues and become who they are, for better or for worse. They can't escape the fact that they're bound by a locality, by people, by a family, by choices and actions that have shaped the world in which they live and shape them still. There are certain virtues, of course, that can only be developed when you live in a community. So let's talk about how some of those virtues are taking place in Jane Austen's work. So you'll see here that I, I, I don't even attempt to give an exhaustive account of this. This is just to give a flavor, a shade. So in Pride and Prejudice, we have in Longbourn, which is the Bennett estate, the town of Meryton, in which it's situated, and Pemberley, which is Mr. Darcy's land, and 10,000 a year, I'm sure, uh, in which we have Pemberley. We have this whole situation. How is it, how is it that each of those places informs the people involved. For Jane Austen, it's not just about drawing room gossip so much as the fact that people only really can live out their lives, can, can make moral actions, can take decisions when they're part of something. You know? So when they're rooted in a place, it's only then that they can really reveal themselves for who they are. Mr. Darcy is Pemberley in a lot of ways. He's defined by its very characteristics, by its shapes. When Bennett, when Elizabeth Bennett arrives in Pemberley, it's this revelation as to who he is, this manifestation of who Mr. Darcy really is, not just her misguided misapprehension about him. Why? Because it's only in Pemberley that Mr. Darcy is really most fully himself. It's only then that she can really get at the truth of who this man is, of how he relates to his family, of how he's rooted of what his inner character is like, which is expressed both metaphorically and, and in other powerful ways, perhaps even literally, by the way in which he orders his estate. So too with her parents. Elizabeth Bennet lives in a disordered household, a disordered household that's a consequence of an ill-advised marriage between her father and her mother, a marriage that, as we'll see later, is not an exemplar of the highest form of married friendship that can exist. And therefore, when she has to confess, when she has to confess in the face of withering attack that indeed her sisters weren't well-educated, 
that indeed she lacks many of the, much of the formation that she would otherwise wish she had, it's a sign. It's a powerful exercise of, of pointing to where Elizabeth Bennet became herself and who she is. She's barely still in the gentry. She's barely hanging on there. And yet, she can't be understood apart from Longbourn. Notice also how it's in these kind of contexts that people can become radically changed. Look at what happens to Lydia when soldiers, outsiders, come into a place like Meryton and set up shop nearby. The only hint, really, that there's these huge geopolitical forces that are going on. The only impact is that there are some local members of the militia, who, by the way, of course, were preparing in the event of a Napoleonic invasion to defend the home territory. So this was not the finest part of the British fighting outfit. It's kind of the bottom of the ranks uh, in many ways. And here they are right in Meryton. Here they are. And they're outsiders. And so they're uprooted. And so guess what their effect on the morals or the life of the town is? It's something that sets Mrs. Bennett and Lydia a Twitter. But that's an example of just how misguided they are, of how lacking in important virtues they are. Elizabeth Bennett recognizes that even though she has certain temptations towards it, she recognizes the allure, the charms, as we'll talk about in the next section of Mr. Wickham. But enough about Pride and Prejudice for the moment. Let's notice that in Emma, in Emma, we have these neighboring estates which act as the grounds of communication. So here we aren't even talking about a whole town, really, although there is a town. We have Mr. Knightley's estate, and then we have the self-professed Emma's estate. So here we are, you know, we're in these two different places. What exactly is going on? Well, it's constant going back and forth. It's a constant going back and forth. It's Mr. Knightley inviting Emma into, into his estate, into his friendship, into union with him in some way. It's that sharing of life that takes place. Notice that the context is not just abstract. If anything, Austin is abstract about physical details about the particularities. If you look for her descriptions of people, they aren't always very fleshy, shall we say. They don't reveal a lot about what people look like, but they reveal a lot about where they're from, how they live, what the context of their moral decisions is. And so that's what we're meant to take away. What we're meant to see is that people are rooted in places and families. People are grounded in their sense of virtue or vice in their police, and in this case, it's their home. Finally, I just want to mention Mansfield Park, which is often one of the most disliked of all of Austin's. Who here has read Mansfield Park? That's good, that's good. Uh, who here is considering, but feels reluctant about reading Mansfield Park? Okay, I, was it because of my introduction the most unpopular? <laughs> it's funny, because McIntyre claims that Mansfield Park is the most Aristotelian of all of them. And it's perhaps, as we'll get into, because the character lacks a lot of the charms that are conventionally appealing. She does. I'm sorry. She does. Like, Fanny Price is just not completely charming. She's a little priggish sometimes, and she's always right and patient, and she's just sitting there waiting for things to happen. Uh, so it's a little frustrating. But the thing is, that's meant to actually direct our eyes to a deeper truth about what real virtue is, about what constancy and prudence constitutes. In any event, what I want to talk about here is the fact that Edmund Bertram, who ultimately, spoiler alert, be careful, Edmund Bertram marries the girl, Edmund Bertram marries Fanny, uh, ultimately, it's because Edmund Bertram has a view of what his job as a clergyman is, an Anglican clergyman. It's to build up and influence the morals of his people in his local place, where he is. He contrasts it with the experience, in fact, when he's talking to Mary, he contrasts it with the experience of the clergy in London, who are often swallowed up in their flocks and can't influence or guide them. By contrast, Edmund's virtuous understanding of what it means to sacrifice himself for holy orders means that he finds himself. He finds himself. His role, his fulfillment, is actually in leading, shaping, governing, sanctifying his flock. That's what he's meant to do. It's a very local place. It's a small place. It's not London. It's not the colonies. It's not the wealth and exoticism that are held up by Henry and Mary. Instead, it's particular. It's local. And so Jane Austen is yet again drawing our attention. What really shapes us? 
What really makes us who we are? What's the moral environment in which we take on our identity? It's those communities. It's those families. It's those places. Let's move on to the importance of virtue, of prudence and constancy especially. This is part four, if you're following in your handout. Character is at the center of the drama, I say. And that's because the virtues that people do have and how they make them is really what drives the plot. It's really what drives the plot. You know, that's what's determining a lot of the action here. If you look to something like Pride and Prejudice, for example, what's the, what's the kind of obvious takeaway? Falling in love isn't just love at first sight. In fact, I think the first draft of the title was First Impressions. So it's meant to show first impressions are often faulty. What really is the foundation of a good match with the foundation of an enduring friendship is character. It's who you are. It's the virtues you have. And lacking important virtues means that you have to be aware of that when you're entering into friendship, when you're entering into marriage. Failure to take that into account can lead to disaster, as we see repeatedly. What is the essential virtue for Aristotle? For Aristotle, it's undoubtedly prudence. Prudence has a kind of regulatory, central role for Aristotle, and it does for Christians as well, in St. Thomas's adaptation, his taking up of Aristotelian thought. Prudence is, in a certain sense, a queen, because she regulates how all these other virtues take place. You know, Father Raymond could go off half-cocked, fighting the barbarians, you know, slaying the Moors, doing all sorts of dramatic things. But prudence dictates, no, he has other virtues he needs to exercise well. In fact, it's being able to do the right thing in the right time, in the proper context, that defines making something a virtuous act. You can't do it without prudence. Father Raymond could stay up all night, every night, saying extra prayers. That would be a wonderful thing in many ways. But Father Raymond also has to get up and say the 7 a.m. Mass sometimes. And so if Father Raymond's habitually late and inattentive to his duties, even if he's doing something else that's seemingly good, it can actually become vicious. It can actually become unvirtuous, precisely because there needs to be that balance, that regulation, that moderation that helps give a sense of proper proportion. How we go from here to the end, to the telos, to the object of an action. Prudence is what chooses the means. It's what determines what the best way possible of attaining an end is. And so, in the end, our prudence often reveals, in a certain sense, in its presence or its absence, how high, how good the ends we have that are. Are they good? Are they noble? Are they base? Well, that's revealed somewhat in how we actually take practical action and what means we choose. So let's consider a few examples, applying it to Jane Austen. For Austen, when you see the word constancy, when you see constancy, you should imagine something more than just consistency. You should imagine this kind of rich Aristotelian notion of prudence, of phrenesis. You should, you should summon to mind this sense of like well-regulated, well-moderated action that knows the end and knows the best means. For Austen, constancy is an expression of this great virtue because what it means is Christian patience and perseverance in doing good, even in the face of other things that would distract you from it, even in the face of challenges or obstacles. So let's use a few examples. Fanny Price in Mansfield Park is the exemplar, especially, especially in McIntyre, for what this kind of prudent behavior is. Fanny Price, as I, as I revealed, in my heart of hearts, I find it difficult to like her, you know. But that's because when I read a novel, you know, that is of this genre, you're looking for someone who charms you. You're looking for someone who's amiable. In Austin's taxonomy, amiable people aren't virtuous necessarily. It's important to have a loving concern for other people, but merely the appearance, the manners that suggest amiability aren't enough and in fact can be deceptive because they can reveal an undercurrent of manipulation and danger. So for Austin in a novel like, uh, like Mansfield Park sets up the amiable Henry who's ultimately unreliable, who's ultimately prone to make terrible decisions against the virtuous Edmund and the virtuous Fanny who, thanks be to God, find themselves together by the end, are drawn together in no small part thanks to Fanny's constancy her willingness to undergo the kind of long, patient wait 
for Edmund to have his dalliance, to go around and to finally come back to her at the end. There is a sense in which charm can be mistaken for important social virtues. So we've just talked about how important the local place is. Well, this leads us to the danger that we could just think that friendliness, amicability, being a good conversationalist, that those constitute being a virtuous member of the community. Austin reveals the truth. It's not. It's not, and she forces us to meditate on it. She forces us to dwell on the fact that sometimes the people who seem like the most fun end up creating the most tragedy, end up creating the most unhappiness in their lives and in others' lives, precisely because amiability isn't what really matters. What matters is loving concern for other people, a loving concern that takes place in a virtuous way, a prudent way, a constant way. Another example that I, I can't help but use uh, is my favorite novel of Jane Austen's, which is Persuasion. A lot of people don't tend to read Persuasion. If there's one novel that you have, who's here read Persuasion? Oh, that's good. That's even better. Read Persuasion. If you haven't read Persuasion, read it. Because I find Anne Elliot irresistible. I love Anne Elliot. Um, the story of Persuasion is the story of a young woman, Anne Elliot, who is uh, the kind of woe-begotten daughter of a silly and irresponsible baronet. Uh, she is in this position wherein she has fallen madly in love with a naval captain who's poor. And so she takes advice from her aunt. She takes advice from her aunt and decides to reject him. The novel begins about 10 or 12 years after the fact. And she is still single. She's still waiting. The family's finances are ruinous and they're going to have to sell the house or at least rent it out for a period of time. And suddenly, suddenly, this old captain reappears and Anne's life is turned upside down from the inside out, like she's a complete mess. And it seems like he treats her with total indifference. It's a beautiful story. It actually is, I think, one of Austen's most subtle and powerful and moving stories, precisely because it both combines this sense of why was Anne Elliot worth waiting for? Why was Anne Elliot worth waiting for? Because even though she needed to grow in virtue, even though she was too easily persuaded by her aunt, for reasons which you have to admit are not entirely imprudent, for reasons which are somewhat responsible, but which were disloyal to her deeper knowledge of character. And in the end, what character is what really matters. So we can forgive her for this fault because you see in her patience, in her long-suffering quality, in her willingness to stand by relations and other family members, even when they're so incredibly boorish and self-centered, we see someone who is a living, beating heart of her family, even though she's ignored and mistreated. That is a beautiful thing because it's often revealing that romance isn't so much about being swept off your feet. It's about seeing the person within, about recognizing what makes for true happiness. Anne and Captain Wentworth, the, the Navy captain, they have a possibility of real happiness, which I'll talk about more in a moment, precisely because they both have the virtues that make it possible for them to live together. Unlike her father, who is doomed to unhappiness because he's so vain and self-centered, he's unable to love others in the proper way. He's unable to give himself for his community, for his family. And his conversation and his behavior reflect that interior deficit of character. I've mentioned here growth and virtue, so the last thing I'll say on this point is about Back to Pride and Prejudice. Austen's novels don't always reveal fully baked characters, you know, in the sense of they're done growing. It's often about someone's growth in virtue. So we don't need to just flatten these characters in Jane Austen and say, oh, well, this person represents virtue, this person represents vice, and bada bing, bada boom, you add in some, some inheritance law, and there you go. <laughs> yeah. English inheritance law is fascinating, though, you have to admit. Like, who came up with the entail, exactly? Who came up with the entail? Okay, yes, Lord Julian Fellows did not come up with the entail. And by the way, Downton Abbey is, is just a latter-day, you know, reproduction of this absolute irrationality of English property law. But anyway, that was solved in the 1940s in a certain sense. We'll talk about that, not at all tonight. Uh, 
But no, these aren't just flat characters. These aren't just flat characters. The title characters, in a certain sense, of Pride and Prejudice are proud and prejudiced. Proud Mr. Darcy, prejudiced Elizabeth Bennet. It's precisely because they both lack certain virtues which they need that because of that they can be good for each other. It's not that they're perfect, it's that they know in what ways they each need to grow in virtue. Mr. Darcy's refusal to recognize this, his proud and stubborn resistance to seeing their equality in character, is what causes Elizabeth to react with such vigor. And her prejudice makes it worse because she's willing to just make snap judgments. So again, the story is one that we can profit from. It's not simply a matter of being perfect. If that were the only people we're interested in, then it would be a very boring world indeed. But rather the sense in which, how are we made better? How do we grow in virtue? And that, Father Raymond, is a perfect segue to point five. I'm sure you'll agree. Types of friendship. Types of friendship. Because really, until we get down to friendship, these first two points are somewhat abstract. They're somewhat abstract. So we've talked about where do people find their fulfillment and their meaning. It's in community, family, locality, church, country, all of those dimensions. And Austin focuses on the local and the familial. We've talked about virtue and the importance of prudence and constancy, of being a well-balanced, well-tempered person. Not just apparently amiable, not just well-mannered, but someone in whom those manners reflect a concern for the other, a love for the other that is moderate and well-regarded, like well-established. Ultimately, though, the way in which we become virtuous, the way in which we attain happiness, comes through friendship. This is Austin's point, which is the subject of much controversy. Because as Alan Bloom, in his, no, in his, uh, in his book Love and Friendship, describes Austin as trying to create an equivalency, or trying to create a unity somehow, between classical Aristotelian notions of friendship and modern romance modern romance, affairs of the heart, you know, things about which we, we feel strongly. And he says it doesn't work. He says it doesn't work in the end. I think Bloom is wrong, needless to say. And in fact, I think it's important that we see in which Austin is drawing these portraits of friendships, which become marriages. She's not just making a kind of conventional point. It's not just because Austin can't see beyond married life as the fulfillment or the purpose. It's in fact a deeper reason. Let's first talk about Aristotle's understanding of friendship. And don't worry, we're almost at the end. So, so hold on, stay with me for a second. Aristotle's understanding of friendship is that it leads us towards the end. Friendship is about two people, shoulder to shoulder, gazing at the same end together, loving the same good together. That good pulls them together and their love for one another based on a shared good, enables them to know and love each other more deeply. There's a kind of interpenetration of hearts that's taking place, a sharing of souls in different respects. People can become very rhapsodic when they talk about this, but in truth it's because of the, it's one of the most powerful human experiences. We're made to live in communion, and we desperately want to be understood. The terribly hurtful and frustrating thing is that we don't understand ourselves, and so other people don't often understand us correctly. What hurts more than being misunderstood? What hurts more than having a friend misinterpret an action that you're doing? Or read different motives into something that you say? What hurts more than having that communion, that union be thwarted? It's painful, it's, it's elemental in a certain sense because it strikes at our very foundational desire, our foundational need to be known and to be understood. Ultimately, of course, the Christian recognizes it's in friendship with God that we have a friend who knows us perfectly and who enables us to love others properly, not just as a means to self-fulfillment, but for their own sake, for God's sake, ultimately. But let's focus on what Aristotle describes in friendship. Aristotle describes friendship as the kind of transcending of this limitation of our inability to know and love one another well. He describes three different kinds of friendship, classically. Now, some of these we wouldn't even call friendship at all, but he gives it the term, at least. There's utilitarian friendship. There's pleasurable friendship. 
And then there's virtuous friendship. So these are the three kinds, at least, that he uses in the Nicomachean Ethics. What is the utilitarian friendship? I like to think of it as LinkedIn friendship. <laughs> it, is, it is networking. And it's not bad. It's not bad in and of itself. It, it is actually, it has, it has a certain right ordering. It's, ah, it's, oh yes, you know my friend Smith. He can help you a lot with your sprockets. You know, like he, he, can, he can be of great assistance. How often do we get to use sprockets anymore? <laughs> what a sign of the, of the woe-begotten digital age in which we lead, which we live, that we don't talk about sprockets <laughs> that often. Like the Jetsons sprockets were a thing still. Like you still had sprockets everywhere. When did you last have to change out of sprocket in something? Anyway, anyway, widgets and sprockets. A business friendship is a friendship in which the end is our mutual profit. The end is our, is our flourishing in some way together. That's great. That's great. It doesn't mean that you manifest your soul to those who, with whom you're doing business. But it does mean that there's a definite limit. There's a context in which this takes place. Pleasurable friendships, it's harder to make those virtuous. But they do seem more intimate and more genuine at the first. A pleasant friendship is classically a friendship among young people. It's often, though not always, based on desire in some sense. It doesn't strictly mean like sexual desire only. It can mean a kind of desire for fun times, for pleasure, for fulfillment, for, for doing stuff that's satisfying. It's taking pleasure in that. And then as soon as that fades, your reason for associating with that person goes away. You know, why would you bother sticking around? Why would, why would you do that? If you aren't having fun anymore, then let's move on. A lot of our friendships when we're growing up take on this form. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It doesn't mean that they're bad, but it does mean that there's a definite limit to them. They have to, they have to cross a frontier that's often very difficult because the whole relationship has been founded upon what you're doing for the other. It's use still on some level. The virtuous friendship is the truest kind. The virtuous friendship is a friendship of souls. It's a friendship of the good. It's loving the good together, and that means that you then share something that orders your soul rightly. And so friendship becomes a mode in which you live virtuously. You do good things. You become better. You become more yourself for that shared life with a friend. For Aristotle and St. Thomas alike, this kind of friendship is rare rare. You shouldn't expect to have dozens of these kind of friends because you give yourself over to this friend. You're sharing part of yourself with them. And if you keep sharing yourself, pretty soon you'll look down and there's nothing left. There's nothing left. You've got to have a certain moderation and circumspection about this kind of friendship. Aristotle describes it as requiring testing. Testing, which is just another way of allowing time to develop it and seeing how your love of the good deepens and how your times together and separate can help create a life that's shared towards a greater end. Friendship is essential to happiness. You can't really be happy without friends. Aristotle famously writes, what would the point of life be? Who would want to have it if one had not friends? What is the relationship of all of this notion of friendship to Austin? For Austin, Married life is a fulfillment of our potential for friendship. That kind of romantic love that the modern age idealizes can be a strong and vibrant part of friendship in the married life, but it's got to run deeper. It can't just be upon infatuation that we give ourselves over to another. It's not just based on sentiment that we know who we should spend our lives with. It's not just on charm or appearances that we suddenly reveal the person behind. No, it requires a long time of knowing them, of realizing their character, of seeing how they behave, of allowing them to grow, that then you can open up that prospect, that possibility of a shared life. Pride and Prejudice affords us three beautiful examples. They're not all beautiful, but they're three really neat examples of these different kinds of friendships in married form. The utility. This is Mr. Collins and Charlotte Lucas. Poor Charlotte. <laughs> Poor Charlotte. But Charlotte made a practical decision. She put her principles into effect. You have to give that to Charlotte. Like even though you might be a little, dis I was always a little disgusted by Charlotte <laughs> Lucas, I have to admit. Like, 
you know, Elizabeth just rejected him. She knows how awkward the whole situation is going to be, but she just pounces. She's right in that lane ready to chat up the insufferable Mr. Collins. But the thing is, Mr. Collins and Charlotte both want the same thing out of marriage. They both basically want protection, safety, security. Charlotte's obsessed with safety. She lives in constant fear that she's too old, that she's not protected. She needs to find somebody. And Collins ultimately isn't the type who's really interested in sharing himself. He's interested in having somebody who can keep his house and home and in whom he can take pride. There you go. But it's a friendship of utility. And so therefore, it's not a friendship. It's not a marriage that the reader is really in love with, that the reader is really drawn into, because you clearly see the contours of what it is. Does that mean that this is a bad marriage? Not necessarily, no, not at all. In fact, maybe they'll live a long and relatively happy marriage, but there's a limit to their happiness. There's a limit to how much they can be fulfilled in this relationship. Now, what about pleasure? Ah, yes, now salacious times. Mr. Wickham, bring my smelling salts, Mr. Wickham. Mm. It would take, it would take someone as shallow and stupid as Lydia to find, <laughs> to find Mr. Wickham a desirable mate. But she takes after mom, so it makes sense. It makes sense. That is the ultimate example of a friendship of pleasure. A friendship of pleasure. And that's one which we can clearly see is destined to unhappiness, is destined to frustration. Will they ever really understand why? No, because unfortunately, vice entraps us in ignorance. Vice prevents us from seeing things clearly. So they're on a very dangerous and unfortunate road. In a certain way, similar to the road that Mr. and Mrs. Bennett traveled, in which Mr. Bennett became so disengaged, so irresponsible, because he had almost contempt for his wife, had such disregard for her, that he was seriously negligent in his responsibilities. The whole Lydia affair couldn't have taken place without Mr. Wickham accurately reading Mr. Bennett as a weak figure whom he could take advantage of. But what about virtue? Notice there's kind of soft choral singing floating in <laughs> to the room as we finally talk about Elizabeth and Darcy. <laughs> finally. This is a virtuous friendship. This is a virtuous friendship, which, let's note again, let's note again, for clarity's sake, doesn't mean they're perfect, anything but. But it does mean that they're both ordered to the good. There is the potential in their marriage for a kind of lifelong union, a friendship that can deepen and make them both into who they're meant to be. And it's not just because of a kind of romantic pastel. It's because they're the type of character they each share the virtues that can bring out the best in the other, that can challenge the other, that can help the other love the greatest good, because they both love the good. And that's apparent in the way they treat their families. It's apparent in the way that they relate to where they're from and defend it and support it and protect it. And it's the apparent in the way that they're willing to see past each other's faults at a certain point, finally, at the end. It's why that's such a satisfying ending, because you start to love both of these characters. They're both good people. And in the end, isn't that what we're really talking about? What makes them good people? It's virtue. It's loving the good, which is greater than them. I'm going to skip the point about Emma here, because I want to conclude. If anyone wants to talk about it, we can, we can get into it in Q&A. Let me just close by talking about how we can read Austen. I actually meant to say read Austin, not read Aristotle. Sorry, that's a typo. Read Austin as a Catholic, as a Thomist. Notice how the Austin novels always end in a wedding. <laughs> Notice how they always end in a wedding. This is not just because of bourgeois convention. For Austin, a wedding represents a kind of anticipation of a happy life and a happy community that's formed from a total self-gift, that's formed from entering into a common good that's greater than yourself. There's a reason why it always ends in a wedding, because we hope for the wedding feast of the Lamb. There's a reason it ends at the wedding breakfast, because we still live in hope for the Eucharist. There's a reason it ends in a happily ever after on an estate in some place, because we await the vision of God. 
We await the communion of the saints. We await this belonging. And we feel, the reader feels, that they know what it's like to knock on the door of Pemberley 20 years after the wedding, to know what it's like to enter in to the house where you see both Captain Wentworth and Anne Elliot. The reader knows, in a certain sense, what kind of place that's destined to be, precisely because it's all pointed towards, it suggests what marriage is meant to suggest, the union of Christ and his church, the union of Jesus with the soul that loves him, the union of God with each and every one of us, not just as individuals, but as members of Christ's own body. Jane Austen didn't need to be a theologian. She didn't need to be a philosopher. The vision of human happiness, the vision of fulfillment that she suggests here at the end, that's pointed towards in the wedding, in the marriage scene, in that resolution, is not one in which we're just kind of making a tidy bourgeois bow on the package. It's not being a slave of convention. It's seeing that it's only when we give ourselves over to these goods that are greater than ourselves, when we give ourselves over to God, that we can really be who we're meant to be, that we can truly have a happily ever after. Thank you very much for listening. And, and thank you for being my example, Father Raymond. I'm happy to be the example of a concrete singular. Mm -hmm. um, I suggest uh, that we take just a couple of minutes to enjoy the snack, which Mary has generously prepared for us, and, and get drinks. So and we'll come back for Q&A. We'll give Father Henry a chance to rest his amiable self for a few minutes. The amiable Father Henry. Um, <laughs> uh, while we enjoy the snack, would you like to say something about it? Uh, let's reconvene in five minutes, shall we? Here, I'll come lead the way to the snacks so you feel confident.
so we're going to resume. Don't sit down if you're getting snacks, by all means. But Father, I think. Okay, good. Just checking. Yep. I turned it off right oh, a moment perfect, ago, perfect, but yeah, perfect. I turned it back on. You already have the happy tooth. Um, so I see some some new faces here, and I wanted to um, take the opportunity. If you haven't yet come to the lecture and written down your name on this email sign up. Please consider doing that because it'll allow me to kind of tell you about events like this in the future. So if you haven't written down anyone bold and wants to start, write down on your. Or you could put it on the chair. Okay. You know. Or you could put it on the chair. That's right, but you know, peer pressure. A hand bird is much better than a bush bird, right? Um, we could Thanks. feed two birds with one scone. Um, <laughs> Uh, Can I just say the scones are delightful? So I. Man, oh, and now. we have scones. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Um, I, you didn't even know you were making the pun. No. Come on. So um, I'll bring the microphone to you. It won't amplify your voice, but it will help. Uh, you know, Father Henry's mother and others um, to to hear your question. Thank you, Raymond. <laughs> Any questions? So I did want to just say, as a pitch, right at the outset, if you haven't read Austin's novels, if you've only seen the movies or if you've not read some of them, like Persuasion or like Mansfield Park, you should do it. You can get all of them for less than 25 bucks. Right here, you can actually get them for free on, on Kindle. Uh, but you can get them all in this one massively inconvenient volume uh, <laughs> with gutter margins like you wouldn't believe. Uh, but it's actually delightful to read them next to each other. I, I think that if, there was, if, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, what should I read first? Pride and Prejudice is the classic. You know, Pride and Prejudice is the most loved. And there's a reason. It's, it's emotionally satisfying to see people grow. You know, and the hero and the heroine are suitably flawed to make them interesting. Uh, if you're looking for my favorite, I've already said it, it's Persuasion. Um, because you see flaws, deep flaws, but there's also a kind of a greater attention to constancy and to prudence, which I think are really delightful. And so I, I, love, I love persuasion. Uh, if you want to test out Alistair McIntyre's claim, read Mansfield Park. Like if you want to see what it's like to have a hero, heroine who is not charming, you know, I'm, I'm a little hard on Fanny Price. I want to apologize to this section about <laughs> Fanny Price. I just don't like her that much. I know. But, uh, but the thing is, the thing is, Fanny Price is a virtuous woman. And even though she doesn't catch the reader's emotions in the same way. That's the same reason why she was so highly sought after in the end. Because when you, when you look beyond the surface, when you go beyond the first impressions, you see someone of deep character, uh, someone who's really prudent and constant. So anyway, let's open it up to questions. Thank you all so much for your questions. <laughs> yes. If you don't start well, asking questions, I'll start asking myself I, I think questions this, and giving this answers. This may be the first one where we've had so many of the books are familiar to everyone. You know. It's true. Um, so I think people are poised to ask questions. Thank you, Father. I really was just curious why did you didn't include Sense and Sensibility. Why didn't I include Northanger Abbey, for that matter? Uh, yeah, Sense and Sensibility and Northanger Abbey are excellent. Uh, I could have gone on for a long time about both of them. I just tried to give a few examples, and I went with I went with what I I knew best. Uh, I mean, I've read Sense and Sensibility. It's a great it's a great novel, and it has a lot of these same themes. Um, Sense and Sensibility. What's interesting to note is they go to London. You know, they go and they join the Ton. You know, they go into London for society, and that is an absolutely vicious place. It's absolutely vicious. It's a, it's a total haven of gossip, of slander, of betrayal, of disappointment, of all of these different things. And it's kind of interesting to see it's when you return to the virtuous homestead. It's when you come back to your roots, to where you belong. That's, that's when you're really fulfilled in, in Sense and Sensibility. So the tragedy that propels Sense and Sensibility, you know, marriage, that leads to, you know, and death that leads to disinheritance and all the drama that goes along with that. You have a, you have a powerful sense of, what's, of what really grounds us in happiness, in a place. So I think, I think Sense and Sensibility could have been a great thing, especially in point three, uh, talking about the, the place or the locality. So I could, have, I could have gone into it there. Northanger Abbey is a parody of a Gothic novel. 
So some people read Northanger Abbey and are, are like, well, why is Jane Austen doing this? She's writing as a satire of a form. So in a certain sense, Northanger Abbey doesn't line up as well, precisely because Austen's trying to do something very specific with it. Uh, there's also some of the juvenilia, like Lady Susan, which is never really, fin yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's complicated. When I'm talking, I'm talking about her mature works and like five out of the six. So, other questions? May we, madam? We'll wait till the microphone. Uh, when Father talked last week about Brideshead Revisited, oh, written yeah. by Evelyn Waugh, yeah, Father Nicholas Singham. and he was saying that Waugh died kind of a disappointed, dissatisfied yeah. man, and so we were asking questions about that. What do you know about Jane Austen? Was she um, satisfied with what she portrayed and what she accomplished? She never married, and she died at age 41. So in a certain sense, in a certain sense, Austen is writing about an experience she didn't have. You know, Austen is portraying a reality she didn't get to enjoy to the fullest sense, you know? Uh, she was of ill health. I think that if you're looking for a single character who's most like her, it's probably Fanny Price. You know, it could be Anne Elliot. Uh, in terms of her own, this is, don't apply everything I said about <laughs> Fanny Price to her. I'm just saying, Anne Elliot, Fanny Price is in a certain sense, she's the one stationary person as all the characters in the world move around her. Anne Elliot is the constant woman who's finally rewarded and fulfilled. I don't think that Jane Austen would have identified as much with Elizabeth Bennet. I think she would have identified more with those two characters. Uh, she was a devout Christian, though. You see in her tombstone a beautiful commendation of her virtues written by her family and a kind of statement of what a prudent and constant and patient person she was. So the virtues that she portrays are made explicit in her death. Uh, and I think, again, insofar as we're talking about marriage isn't really just about being married. It's about pointing towards this reality of fulfillment. It's suggesting heaven. It's suggesting that union that we're made for. When they have happy endings, that's only one way of talking about a happy ending, you know? I mean, in the end, that happy ending suggests something even deeper, something even greater. Someone better ask a question, or I'm going to feel terrible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder if you or anyone else had re have read the novel Longborn. Has anybody read that? Which is is uh, sort of a postmodern take of what happens after um, Darcy and Elizabeth marry. I read Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Uh, no. <laughs> and I've read Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters, which is, uh, both of which are fascinating. Um, it, it'd be interesting. Yeah, it seems um, it's sort of the anti this. Um, yeah. Elizabeth's not happy. Um, yep. There's even more tragedy at Longbourn. Um, it's just uh, your talk tonight put that in perspective for me. So I appreciate that. It's interesting how the modern novelist or the postmodern novelist needs to deconstruct. Yeah. They need to make unhappiness. Exactly. They need to thwart fulfillment. And in, this, in certain ways, that can be really useful. I mean, far be it for me to, to condemn the modern novel. It's, a, it's an instrument conveying powerful and deep points, you know, and powerful messages and experiences. So I don't want to just condemn that. I'm just saying, notice how sometimes we love to just attack the good. You know, there's something beautiful in Austen. It's beautiful not just because it's sentimental or bourgeois. It's beautiful because it suggests character and its reward. And that's something that if we, if we give in to the acid bath of cynicism and skepticism, well, no wonder we're so miserable. I mean, because we, we take even the ideal, even the image of what we, we hope to be, even the kind of realistic sense of how the imperfect strive for greater virtue, and we make it something utterly impossible. So I don't like despair. So anyway, that's, that's just my sense. There are some interesting you know, uh, takes on what happens after some of these novels. Pride and Prejudice especially has swarmed a whole cottage industry of successor novels, you know, uh, including a murder mystery, I think. Uh, something about the shades of Pemberley or something, you know, murder at Pemberley, uh, you know, in which I think Lydia gets murdered. 
Uh, which I have to say, notice how that is very satisfying. Like that's, <laughs> yes, you know, absolutely. She had it coming. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry, what was that? That's great. So just to tell the camera, death comes to Pemberley, and they made it into a BBC. It's by P.D. James, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think it's by P.D. James, and she decided to do this book. Uh, I read it. I, I, I wasn't wowed by it. In a certain sense, in a certain sense, it, it, it works. Uh, and I haven't seen the BBC miniseries, but in other ways, it feels too much, so explicitly an homage to what Austin did that it's hard to, for it to stand on its own. You know, so. Maybe a couple more questions to challenge. Ask Father Henry a really tough question. How did you become so smart? Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. How good are you at Scrabble? Yeah. yeah. I'm reasonably good. Yeah. Reasonably good. I think, I think you could conclude. How good am I at tennis? Reasonably bad. You know, I think <laughs> you can draw all these conclusions. Yes? Oh, I knew someone was going to do that. I. <laughs> So, so for, for mom and all the audience at home, uh, the question was, could I address the point that I skipped? Uh, could I address the point that I skipped? Uh, which is, if we look at our outline, it's five, it's the last little bullet point. Friendship is moral pedagogy and Emma. Notice that the friendship between Mr. Knightley and Emma is unequal in certain <coughs> ways. So they're true friends, they're candid friends, they're honest friends. Mr. Knightley, it said explicitly in the novel, is the only person who is able to see Emma's faults. She's so delightful. She's so amiable. People like her so much, and with good reason. But Mr. Knightley knows her better. You know, and knowing and loving go together. You know, knowing and loving are closely linked. Uh, I'm looking to Father Raymond for an affirming hand. I'm like, obviously, Father, yes, quite right, quite right. Uh, indeed. Indubitably. Uh, <laughs> notice how Mr. Knightley, in his friendship with Emma, instructs her as to how to grow in virtue, almost explicitly, explicitly. When Emma makes fun of Miss Bates, you know, who is, who is a poor widowed, or I'm not even sure if she's a widow, I think she's never been married, so she's a poor unmarried woman, and she's kind of awkward and kind of clumsy, and Emma takes her wit her sarcasm, you know, like her ability to, to be a good conversationalist, and is vicious to her, like is cruel and unkind. And Mr. Knightley comes up and says, I can't believe you would do that. You know, I mean, I'm going to rely on our friendship, he says, to tell you right now that that was totally uncalled for. That was totally unjust and unkind. Uh, and Emma tries to defend herself. But in the end, Mr. Knightley pierces through, and Mr. Knightley gets to gets the heart of the matter, which is why they're such a good match, which is why they make good friends. You see that, that way in which friends help each other grow in virtue very explicitly in the relationship between Mr. Knightley and Emma. Uh, and I think it's not just a matter of uh, he loves her so much he can see her faults. It's that he loves her so much he's willing to help her grow precisely in the ways in which she has faults. And I think that's, I think that's a really, that's a beautiful friendship. It's a beautiful marriage that's at the conclusion there. Uh, so yeah, so that, that's what I was going to say. But you see, it's kind of redundant. Like we've already, we've already gotten that point. Uh, so, but Father Henry says, Father Raymond, most of your points were redundant. So if you, <laughs> if you eliminated all the redundant points in your talk, we would have been out of here 20 minutes ago. And I say, well, Raymond, that's unkind. Uh, <laughs> Why would you voice that thought? And he said, well, I didn't mean to. I just had to share. Uh, <laughs> and I say, well, I, Raymond. I think this is rather unfair that he's offering a very insouciant caricature. Oh, please. <laughs> you just know I love the term insouciant. Listen, insouciant, insouciant is a great word. Well, uh, if you ever go to a wine tasting, this is advice. If you ever go to a wine tasting, and if you're asked to like describe the wine, first three words should be impertinent, <laughs> insouciant, <laughs> and then whatever other third word you want. Notes of plum. Notes of plum. Well, that's, yeah, yeah. Surprising finish. Surprising finish. 
Like, don't specify. It's just, it's surprising. It's not what I expected. But like, oh, how would you like this Chardonnay? How would you describe it? I'd say it's an impertinent Chardonnay. Or perhaps that insouciant Chablis, you know. So who could say? See, you get wine tasting advice here. Like, we're, this is, let it be said. Let it be said that we're going into the depths, truly, you know. We really are entering into deep thoughts on Austin. Another one of your favorite words is, is disport. And so I love we, disport, we yes. should all give Father Henry a round of applause for helping us disport ourselves this evening. Thank you. Know. you. Could, you could you bring us into the, the world of supernatural grace now and offer your priestly blessing? Happily. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. And go enjoy a glass of wine with a Jane Austen novel sometime. <laughs>